Welcome, bienvenue, Bojo. Uh, I want to welcome you all uh, to this uh, Seniors Fellows Lunch. My name is Nathalie Desrosiers, and I'm the principal of Massey College. I first want to acknowledge that we are on indigenous lands, the lands of the Yonwanda, the Seneca, and it is a treaty land of the Mississaugas of the Credit. I want to acknowledge our duty of stewardship toward this land as well as our great privilege to be here. And I see one fellow uh, student from the Anishinaabewan course on Saturday morning, so Nathalie uh, Desrosiers <laughs> Inishka. So um, it's a great pleasure to have you all here. What a wonderful opportunity that we have to benefit from the, the presence uh, among us of, of our speaker today. And to introduce her properly, I've asked a senior fellows, uh, uh, Nurjahan Mawani, who's lived in Afghanistan for several years and who's been uh, helping construct a really, a really fruitful relationships with, uh, among others, the Aga Khan uh, uh, Museum and so on. So uh, uh, Nurjahan, if you want to introduce our special guest. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Yes, it's a great turnout, Natalie. I think this is Gazelle. This speaks to the level of interest there is in what you have to say. So I know you're here to, we're all here to listen to Gazelle. But, uh, and I'm, can I assume that some of you or have had a chance to look at the, her bio? I'm not going to read it all because that'll take up uh, most of the afternoon. But um, a few things, if I may, and also perhaps, a couple of personal um, stories about her, because I've known her since she was in Kabul. I was in, in Afghanistan for seven years, uh, representing the Aga Khan Development Network, and that's when we first met. And so there's, uh, there's a story there. But um, Ghazal is a visiting scholar at Massey College and the University of Toronto's Faculty of Law and Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. Uh, she is a constitutional lawyer, and she's going to talk a little bit more about that, but I thought just on this point, uh, her current work is to study the uh, Taliban constitution. And the Taliban constitution actually goes back to 2005. There hasn't been one since then, and Ghazal, we were just talking about the fact that they have the Taliban has acknowledged the 2005 constitution now, uh, which had not happened before. So I think this is a really interesting and an important study, uh, not just from a constitutional point of view, but more importantly about the vision that the Taliban uh, have, has, because there's no one Taliban, but uh, um, that's another story. Um, uh, Ghazal was the first woman to lead a law enforcement institution. Uh, in Afghanistan within the top levels of the Afghan government. Again, this is a time when I was there, so have some idea of what was going on now. She was um, appointed the first uh, ombudsperson of the, in the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. This was in 2019, till, um, and then came 2021. But actually, it was not the Taliban that shut her office down. Hello everyone. Um, thank you for uh, thank you Natalie and Alyssa for uh, putting this um, lunch together. And thanks to all of you for um, coming to this event. It is my pleasure um, to be talking to you about um, Afghanistan and what has been happening. Some of you might have heard me talk before, so I hope I'll not bore you, especially Wanja here. Who, to whom I have talked a lot about Afghanistan. <laughs> um, so it's, it's a pleasure uh, to be here and to uh, talk to you. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, Ambassador Mawani. Um, I have known her from Afghanistan, and I have known her more here in Canada, what a distinguished career she has had. And it has been a pleasure knowing you and having you around. Um, you, you have given me a lot of positive energy since I have arrived to Canada and I've seen you, so thank you. 
Um, I wanted to talk today about um, Afghanistan. I was not sure um, how much did you know about the Afghanistan's history, so maybe just a little bit. We are situated um, at a very interesting strategic location uh, between Central Asia and South Asia, but we're also very close to uh, Middle East. And that situation, that geographical situation, um, has turned out uh, to be a blessing and a curse. Uh, supposedly to be blessing, but we have seen more curses than the blessing. And um, it has resulted um, as Afghanistan to become uh, a buffer state. Um, and also that has then resulted uh, it to be plagued by decades of violence and unrest. Um, so there have been various factions, including the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in uh, 1980s, the Civil War in the 1990s, and the rise and fall of the Taliban regime. All of these have conti continued to contribute to the turmoil. And uh, the people have endured significant hardship as a result of um, these long decades uh, of war and conflict. Um, and it, of course, has had um, uh, lasting effects on countries, political, economic, and social fabric. And I'm sure majority of you have, have um, um, known this, um, at least from the media or some of you who have worked on Afghanistan. Um, so, we're, we're talking about this political, um, the geopolitical importance um, of Afghanistan, um, but as I said, it has also made the country um, um, subject to external interference and vulnerable to conflict and power struggle. Um, the external interferences, um, because Afghanistan, as I said, the location has once, once made it um, a buffer state between um, the Britain Empire and the Russia, um, because of each of them trying to advance um, to the other's region and to uh, the British India on the Soviet's interest and then Central Asia for uh, the Breton. Um, then it, it became a buffer state between Russia and the US during the Cold War period. Um, and again, um, um, the Afghanistan being where it is and then um, the continent, the South Asian uh, continent and some US-backed states. Um, it, it has also resulted in factionalism. Now, I don't want to oversimplify this uh, or ignore other factors that have resulted in factionalism in Afghanistan, but something that has literally um, exacerbated this whole factionalism in the country, one reason has been um, the fact that there has been a lot of international interferences um, inside Afghanistan. And of course, that results in prolonged instability um, and conflict um, throughout the history um, and that has further resulted in a weakening of central government and the difficulty to achieve long-term peace and stability. And of course, these things happen in a country, in a con it has happened to Afghanistan, and what has the result then we don't we have it has hindered Afghanistan's development. I mean for a very long time we have been trying to um, develop the social fabric of the of the country and it has constantly and continuously been um, a challenge. Uh, it has resulted in massive displacements of Afghans, both intern, uh, internally and externally. Afghanistan is, has at some point in time uh, was the, um, um, has had the record of uh, refugees. Um, for 20 years, we made the highest, um, the country with the highest number of cases for UNHCR for 20 years. Um, and the internal displacement as well, millions of internal displacements, human rights abuses. There have been, over all these regimes and all these periods, there have been systematic violation of human rights. Um, and um, of course, there has not been any, um, um, any means of redressal as well. Radicalization and terrorism, eventually with the Taliban um, coming to power, uh, Afghanistan also witnessed um, radicalization and terrorism, and it has has been um, suffering from it uh, to date. Um, even now that the Taliban are in power in Afghanistan was hoping, at least some people were hoping that there will be more safety and security, there isn't. And we see that it has, it is again, um, has, um, um, there have been, um, um, like the leader of Al-Qaeda was killed inside Afghanistan after the Taliban took over. Um, there have been ISIS presence inside Afghanistan. There have been so many fatal 
um, incidents and explosions, particularly on a, um, religious minority groups and ethnic group. So all of these um, um, have happened um, in Afghanistan. Now, who are the Taliban? A lot of us keep talking about them, the Taliban, the Taliban, who are they? Um, Taliban, the name Talib actually means a student. Uh, it's an Arabic term. Um, and these, the, in, within Islamic societies, a person who is gaining uh, religious knowledge or Islamic knowledge is called a Talib, Talib al-Ilm, which is the seeker of the knowledge or the student of the knowledge. Now, this is what this group was. There were a group of madrasa-going uh, people with very um, radical and extremist views um, of the religion. And initially, they started because they thought Afghanistan had gone through so much of the um, civil war and civil unrest. And they said their motto was that we want to bring an end to the civil war in the country and that we're going to reinstate Islamic law in the country. So that's how they started. But of course, immediately, the regional politics and international politics immediately play the role. Um, Taliban soon started to fight for power um, and dominance. And then um, in, in less than 40 years, they had the control of the most of the territory in Afghanistan and had turned to a very radical um, entity um, that, um, um, that uh, I think majority of us know. But they, would know, they were known for their harsh rules and violations of um, the rights of the people. Now, during the Taliban period, there, there's, there are a lot of things changed in Afghanistan. Um, the legal system completely changed. Taliban brought in a version of Islamic law that was based on their own interpretation, a very rigid one. And um, it was not uniformed in different parts of the country. So it was um, basically depending on individual's uh, interpretation or their version of interpretation, they tried to apply the rule. There was no written laws for quite some time. The, uh, the Amir al-Mumineen, or the leader of the Muslims, as they call their leader, that person would just issue edicts and decrees, and that would rule the country. Even now, in our Ministry of Justice website, there are uh, written um, decrees from that time. And a lot of it has been studied by the lawyers, and they show how um, it, it it, it shows that this is this has not been a process of, um, um, how do I want to say this? Uh, it has not been a representative or well thought legislative process, but rather the kind of rulemaking that shows um, an authoritarian leader is just trying to enforce his viewpoints or the ideology of the group uh, in form of um, rules and introducing them to the society. Um, and um, they had a constitution. Um, their constitution um, was allegedly approved in a group of 500 people. That's the only document they have formally acknowledged to have been their constitution. There have been many other versions afterwards which they have not acknowledged. So that's the only one they have acknowledged. But they are not, um, they have not endorsed it now, this time around. Um, we don't have a constitution and uh, they, they keep, uh, giving very inconsistent uh, statements about what the law is and what the constitution would be. So they made this constitution, and this constitution was um, look, would look like anything but a constitution. It lacked all the basic features of a constitution. In terms of the fundamental rights, it was a very weak constitution, referring everything to Islamic law, while keeping it vague, and then in practice, one would see how their interpretation of Islamic law has been extremely rigid and extremely harsh. Uh, although there are different interpretations of different rules, and there are very, very moderate rules on the same subjects, but they have always used the most harsh uh, ones. Um, then, of course, they had their courts back then. The courts, um, uh, they, they were more of executive institutions. There was one a ministry that they created as vice in virtue. So that ministry was basically responsible for um, spotting violations of their rules on, this, um, on the spot and um, issuing uh, punishments and executing punishments on the spot. That would mean flogging women on the streets for uh, violating the dress code or their uh, toes appearing or their fingers appearing or they have um, um, loud, uh, sorry, they have heels or a, 
any kind of, um, 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 of, of what they thought was a violation of their rules. Or if men um, did not have as much of a long beard, so there was a specific length of beard a person should have had, like minimum, if you went below that, the person would be flogged on the street. And these are the kind of rules that they created, and then the enforcement of it happened through executive institutions on the spot. Um, that meant there was, of course, no due process, no courts, nothing. Um, even if courts, in, in certain parts, the courts did exist and people would take their actual litigations and um, let's say if there were issues on land or anything. And even then, there was no unified system of uh, adjudicating the cases. Um, violation of human rights, one of the major um, 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 issues or the major problem with uh, associated with the Taliban. The human rights violation was systematic. Um, as I said, there was no due process um, or access to justice properly. Women's rights uh, were systematically violated. They did not have the right to, to attain education. No schools, no university, no right to work. Um, and um, wearing burqa, not being able to travel without a male uh, um, 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 uh, relative, um, and not just relative, a male companion um, who you would not be able to marry. So very, very specific and harsh rules. And a lot of women suffered because they were widows. They did not have a husband. They did not have a son, or their sons were very um, young. So a lot of um, um, such uh, harsh rules. Um, the violation of religious and ethnic minorities rights um, in, in their Taliban regime, these two groups, religious minority, had um, Hindu minority, Sikh minority in Afghanistan, and we also had a very small remaining of a Jewish um, uh, population in Afghanistan, very small. But um, the Hindus and the Sikhs and the uh, Shia Muslims went through a lot of violation of their rights. They were not allowed to um, practice their religion. There were some systematic discrimination in the courts um, and, and generally within the administration. And the harsh punishments, very harsh punishments amputations, uh, uh, flogging, stoning to that were the kind of punishment the Taliban were known um, to show. Also, um, based on this um, and their very rigid Islamic interpretation, uh, where if a person commits murder, um, the uh, family of the victim um, could actually take the revenge by killing the other person. And first of all, Majority of Islamic countries do not apply that. And even if you go to the, um, historically, to um, the um, um, application of this rule, it has been very, very difficult to apply this rule because it has so many conditions that has to be met. What the Taliban have done not, is not just the fact that they have applied this rule, but they have applied it in the worst case possible. In, a, in one case, um, a man has, had killed another man, and then the son of the victim, who was years old, was given a Kalashnikov to kill the other person in public, um, in a stadium where people were brought to watch what was happening. So the kind of horror um, and violation of rights um, that sometimes, that I, I believe it was there. Um, I was growing up, I was in school when all of this was happening. But I think over time, it, it, we have forgotten uh, what the Taliban have done and what they are capable of. Um, and of course, forced um, conscription and child soldiers. Um, there have been in a very considerable number of child soldiers in the Taliban's groups, and they have been fighting uh, actively in the battlefield. Now, that was with the Taliban. Things got worse when the 9-11 attacks on the U.S. happened and the leader of Al-Qaeda, Osama bin Laden, was found in Afghanistan and then the Taliban refused to hand him over to uh, the United States. Now, following the 9-11 attacks in the United States, assertion of Al-Qaeda's strong influence and presence in Afghanistan, the U.S. appealed its international allies and partners to support a military intervention in Afghanistan. Uh, to topple the Taliban government. Um, it, it did happen in October of 2001, um, and the government collapsed. And subsequently, uh, subsequently, international community worked with Afghanistan, Afghanistan's political factions to establish a new democratic uh, regime. And over the next two, from 2001 to 2021, Afghanistan um, saw a completely 
different, had a completely different experience and unprecedented um, level of development and progress. We had, we got a constitution. The constitution was very elaborate. Um, it introduced three branches of the government, an independent judiciary. Um, introduced a very comprehensive set of fundamental rights, focused on women's equality and rights because of what they had gone through, um, focused on good governance, on rule of law, and democrat uh, democratization, human rights. All of these were there in the Constitution. Now, I'm not trying to uh, to picture to give you a rosy picture. Of course, um, in implementation had a lot of its challenges, what I'll, which I'll come to at a later time. Uh, but it was the best Constitution Afghanistan had. Uh, experience. And the best part of it was that Afghans came together to write this constitution, to draft it, and to, uh, there was a long process of public <coughs> consultation, uh, the first of its nature in Afghanistan, and all resulted in great acceptance and respect for the constitution once it was um, endorsed. Um, uh, there were democratic and representative institutions. The parliament was elected. We had three parliamentary elections. We had three presidential elections uh, after this constitution. We created um, provincial councils that were elected. So a lot of work went into creating representative institutions and uh, giving uh, agency to people, giving the platform for their voices um, to be raised. Um, and of course, Afghanistan has struggled um, in how to harmonize the state law with Sharia law over time, and sometimes we have been good with it, sometimes we have not good with it. Under this constitution, what we tried to do was give the priority to the constitution, to the um, state-made laws, and then in their absence to go to Sharia. But even then, um, the judges could go to Sharia only um, if, if, of course, if there was no rule in the constitution and law, but also if they could access in the best way possible. So again, there was the harmony there um, um, with uh, Islamic law, but the uh, priority was given to constitution and to the laws. Rights and liberties were there. Um, there were uh, further uh, protection given by creating an independent human rights commi uh, commission constitutionally. And um, I think Afghanistan had witnessed the highest level of liberty and freedom after the constitution of 2004, whether we are talking about women's rights, whether we are talking about freedom of expression in media, political rights um, such as being nominated, the right to vote, all of these were unprecedented. The way they were, they were both on paper in the constitution, the guarantees were there, the way they were practiced, and then for their protection there were institutions. But of course, I mean, the last 20 years was also full of challenges. We did have a lot of challenges, a post-conflict country, a country that was completely destroyed. And some of these challenges, and some of these are major challenges, some of these have been shortcomings, have been flaws um, on the side of the government. So illicit drug trade. Drugs in Afghanistan are, are something that you might probably heard as a combination quite a lot. And although in the first um, years of the transition there was a lot of work done to eradicate um, drugs, um, eventually the government was not as simple in eradicating um, drugs. And it, of course, resulted in uh, illicit economy. And it also fueled insurgency in conflict in different parts of the country. Um, corruption spread through all levels of government. Um, it became a, a, one of the major issues of governance in Afghanistan. The way it, it was basically um, through all institutions, but worst was it got ensued into the law enforcement institutions. When your police and judiciary and prosecution are called the top three corrupt institutions in the country, then there's little hope as to thinking of fighting against corruption and making that fight meaningful. Um, institutions, is building in Afghanistan it has been difficult because of a lot of ups and downs, because of a lot of political instability and turmoil. But in the last 20 years, although we tried to do institution building, at times it was pretty weak. The, not all of our institutions were very strong. They did have uh, a lot of weaknesses Inter internally hindered their institutional growth and effectiveness. Insecurity was a major challenge, um, political instability, um, a lot of internal political disputes, fragmented political landscape in Afghanistan, um, and con building consensus and effective decision making uh, was, was a huge challenge. I see a little thing walking from here, but. <laughs> so sorry for that. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> and 
then one of the major challenges was transitional justice, overlooking transitional justice, because with all these years of flag insecurity, war going on, um, once the regime changed in 2002, um, the international community went against the will of the Afghan people to go for a transitional justice process. And they said, no, peace is more important. We need to build on peace in Afghanistan. And going for a transitional justice is to damage the whole, um, um, the, the, the peace and, and the whole notion of peace was very fragile uh, back then in 2002 and 3. So they opted for peace over justice. And eventually, we ended up uh, not having any. Um, and of course, on the side of international community, there were a lot of challenges and short compelled. One of the major issues with the international community was that from time to time, they made Afghanistan their priority and then shifting focus from Afghanistan to somewhere else. Um, this happened in the 90s uh, when U.S. was extremely involved during the Cold War in Afghanistan, especially those Mujahideen groups who were outside Afghanistan, uh, funding them, uh, authorizing them um, to fight in Afghanistan against Russia. And then once they took over the country in 1992, they were left alone. Um, the whole international community abandoned Afghanistan until the Taliban emerged, until the issue of al-Qaeda um, um, uh, was back in question. Um, then in 2004, the U.S. focus shifted to Iraq. Um, later on, the focus shifted to uh, Syria. Later on, the focus shifted recently to Ukraine. So from time to time, things happen internationally that has shifted the attention and the focus of international community from Afghanistan. And Afghanistan has repeatedly been abundant in some very important points, especially the one of 2004 considered to be the opportunity for the resurgence of the Taliban, uh, because before that, they were literally very weakened. And also, not taking much measure against Pakistan, but rather supporting Pakistan as an ally. Uh, Pakistan and their, um, their connection with the Taliban, uh, their support, both financial, military support to the Taliban, intelligence support to the Taliban, giving them safe heavens inside Pakistan, all of these were established facts. But then for the international community and for the US to repeatedly ignore that and overlooked that was one major um, challenge um, that unfortunately Afghanistan had to suffer from. So despite these enormous, enormous challenges that we've talked about and the setbacks um, that we faced, there still remained uh, glimmers of hope. Uh, there was always hope. Um, and the establishment of democratic foundations provided a basis for belief that the new administrations could bring changes. If, I, for example, I thought if this current government is not, it's okay, in a few years we'll have a new administration. We have the, um, the um, what do you call it, the foundations there, the constitution is there, and institutions will keep changing and getting better. So there was always that hope. Uh, we, we were determined that we will um, do something for this country, and I think a lot of us did. Um, there was a lot of opportunity, but I think a lot of us also contributed significantly to the country. When I went to Afghanistan back in 2002, I was a high school graduate. It gave me a lot of opportunities. I went, I did my undergraduate, I, I got a scholarship, went to the UK to do my master's. Went back, started working um, as, a, as an assistant, ended up being the state's ombudsperson. So it gave us a lot of opportunities. Um, although if the Taliban existed, I probably would not even finish my school. But then at the same time, there was this group of people who, so Afghanistan doesn't only hold um, world record on refugees, but also holds, this is a fact that a lot of people know, that Afghanistan holds the record of repatriation, voluntary repatriation back to the country as well. In 2004, uh, 2002, nearly around 4 million people went back to Afghanistan voluntarily, and they started to contribute to the, and participate in the reconstruction of the country. Um, and then, of course, of course, after all of this, we had um, the Taliban, we had this democratic transition, and then we went back to the Taliban. And that was uh, a puzzle uh, for a lot of people. Um, and the international community at some point in time decided that they wanted to directly talk with the Taliban, and they did. Um, they said it has been two decades of conflict. Uh, we don't think military solution is the right solution. We have to engage in negotiations. They said engaging with the Taliban in peace talk uh, was an attempt to address the group's grievances, um, although initially it was the U.S. that had designated the uh, group as a terrorist group. 
Uh, and they said it would secure uh, guarantees from the Taliban that Afghanistan will not be used as a safe haven for terrorism that would, um, that would um, impact U.S. national <coughs> security. Um, and that the talks offered an opportunity to facilitate withdrawal of international troops. So this, these are the few things that the international community had in mind, and to, that's how they went for the peace talks. So they go for the peace talks, and they completely sideline the Afghan government, turn empowers the Taliban, because now they're not just the terrorist groups, they're in Qatar, in Doha, in luxury homes, in hotels. Their travel bans have been uh, removed. People who were on the blacklist and on the uh, were designated terrorists with millions of dollars of award on them, were now walking free in Qatar and negotiating with the U.S. official representatives. That is what happened. And then the U.S. signed an agreement with the Taliban in February of 2020 that was a disaster. Uh, they signed this deal and agreed that they will, um, they will uh, withdraw forces by September of 2021, but they will also immediately release 5,000 prisoners of the Taliban. In Anas Haqqani, who was one of the top um, uh, minds behind all the terrorist attacks, explosions, suicide attacks inside Afghanistan. So that happens, um, and then uh, Taliban are empowered, their prisoners are, um, are released. Uh, the international community has accepted that they're going to withdraw all their forces, and uh, government is not part of all of this. Now imagine, if you're thinking of a balance of power uh, at, at this stage, what does it look like? Where is the state, where is the Taliban, and where does the international community stand? Um, so long story short, the troop withdrawal starts, and it's in July when it speeds up, and, and um, all of a sudden, the U.S. wants to withdraw all of its people. And then by the end of July, things are getting very, very uh, tough for Afghanistan, and very suddenly. Um, suddenly, the uh, provinces collapse in the hands of the Taliban. Um, they take territory with unprecedented speed and scale. And before we know it, of 2021, they take control. And now I've said that to a number of people in this room. It happened so unexpectedly that we literally had no idea uh, that the Taliban will be taking the country the next day. Nobody was prepared for it. Um, things were getting worse around the capital, in the provinces, but nobody thought that Kabul would fall of the Taliban so soon. Even the Taliban did not think that. Even they were surprised the way the capital uh, fell into their hands. And what happened next? Um, I don't have to repeat myself. Everything I told you about the Taliban last time is happening, <laughs> right? So probably there's no point in repeating it. Women don't have their rights. Their rights have been violated. They, don't, they cannot go to school. They cannot go to university. They cannot work. And um, I, the only area where they're allowed to work is health. Um, and we don't know how long is that going to uh, be the case um, because now they can only work in the health sector. And it's interesting because if they're not going to university schools, then in a few years' time, we won't have female doctors, female nurses. And then again, what would be the impact on, on women's health? Uh, women do not have access to justice. This is one major area that doesn't get to international media because if there are no female judges, no, no single employee within the overall legal and justice sector. So then when who has a case that has to take to the court, nobody is going to register her case. So they literally are denied justice. Uh, and even if in certain provinces somebody is more moderate and allows them to, to file a case, it is very likely that if the other side of the case, uh, the other party to the case is a male individual, the decision will be made in their favor uh, and in the absence of women. Um, there was this um, shelter houses in Afghanistan um, that the victims of violence against women were given shelter from their families. Those were all shut down, and those, many of those women uh, were either stranded or had to go back to their families, and who knows, majority of them might already be killed because they brought dishonor to their family, going to the government to the court in the first place and taking shelter in a government-provided shelter. Freedom of press and expression has been in the worst of, uh, it's, uh, it, it has been really, really bad. A censorship, um, uh, the torture, beating of the media uh, and journalists, shutting down outlets has been um, there very, very much. Political instability, there's a lot of concern with regards to the legitimacy of this government. 
Um, Taliban don't want to go for representative institutions because they believe that um, they don't need to. They are an Islamic group and they have an Amir al muminin the leader of the Muslims, and ask them to just lead the country. But in reality, they're also afraid of going for elections because they know they're not going to be able to get any or votes or probably very little uh, as they don't have that backing uh, when you go back to the society. They don't have an inclusive government. Um, what the people in uh, we have Afghanistan, what are different ethnic groups and diverse um, um, country that we have, the government is uh, not um, uh, um, inclusive. Um, and um, that, of course, uh, fuels internal um, um, conflicts and ethnical tensions in Afghanistan. Um, there is uh, resist er, insurgency against the Taliban um, that might result in, in another civil war. Terrorism and extremism is at, is at rise. Um, IS and the number and kind of attacks they're going. Uh, and of course, the economic crisis. There's a huge economic cost of this whole uh, uh, failed peace deal. Uh, now, this, this is what, uh, what the Afghanistan under the Taliban, unfortunately, looks like. Now, a lot of the time I get asked, what do you think the future looks like? What should be the solution? What could be the solution? Um, it's very difficult to say what could be the solution or what should be the solution because um, a lot of the solutions about need, need a lot of prerequisites. So if we say, okay, we want the government of Taliban to be toppled and we want a new democratic regime. We did that in 2002. Is the world going to really invest again that much in Afghanistan? Um, are they going to do that? If they wanted to do that, why did they hand over the country to the Taliban? Um, or if we are going to sit down with the Taliban and negotiate um, to, to, for change, what are the kind of issues that we want to talk about? Should they be given recognition or not? I, for one, have a lot of difficulty thinking about whether they should be given recognition or not because there, there's a lot at stake of these issues. If they are given recognition, what does it mean for Afghanistan, for the future of that country, for the millions of people who are still there? If they're not recognized, then we have a humanitarian crisis in that country. How do you deal with that? So there's a lot of dilemma with what needs to be done uh, with, with the Taliban. But nevertheless, uh, I believe that the international community has a responsibility um, not to leave Afghanistan in a situation that it is uh, right now, because I don't think the world would, would be able to afford a human crisis that's right now going on in Afghanistan. Thank you very much.